So now as we continue our look through circulation, what we're going to be focusing on now is vertebrate circulation, and that's what we'll entitle the next flowchart. So this is going to be circulation that's going to be found within a closed circulatory system in usually what we would consider higher order organisms, more advanced, bigger, active organisms. Vertebrate circulation, therefore. So what we're going to be focusing on here is the idea that vertebrates undergo something known as cardiovascular circulation. Circulation that surrounds a heart and different vessels, vascular. So we have cardiovascular system that's going to be specifically found in the majority of vertebrates. A cardiovascular system is a system that will be closed, like we've stated before in our first flowchart. So it's a closed circulatory system with a couple of different major components that we want to highlight a little bit further. First and foremost, it's going to be a closed circulatory system that has blood. Blood is going to serve as, of course, the circulatory fluid. So we'll state that blood is present as we've seen before in the previous flowchart. This serves, again, just to remind ourselves, as the circulatory fluid within vertebrates that have a cardiovascular system. Blood is going to be now pushed through this closed system, through this cardiovascular system, via blood vessels. Okay, It's going to go and hop on and hop within blood vessels to move to the correct spots. But blood vessels within vertebrates have a very a hierarchical organization that we need to understand. So let's take a look. So remember, another component of all circulatory systems are vessel networks. Let's take a look at the vessel network found within cardiovascular systems within vertebrates. So blood vessels. There are basically going to be three types that we'll generally cover um, right now. The three types of blood vessels are as follows. We're going to see that in vertebrates that have a cardiovascular system, there will be arteries. Arteries are going to be those blood vessels that bring blood away from the heart brings blood, and the key idea here is that this is going away from the heart. It's very important to understand direction whenever we're talking about circulation because the direction of the circulatory fluid is going to be a major component of how circulatory fluid moves around. So arteries are going to be, uh, they're going to serve the role of bringing blood away from the heart, and if it's going away from the heart, it must therefore be going towards the place that needs the blood, that needs the nutrients, the oxygen, whatever it may be, that would be the organs of the body. So away from the heart to the organs of the body. Now, remember, we stated that the blood vessels in these types of closed circulatory systems are going to branch into smaller vessels. And we're going to now look at how arteries branch into smaller vessels. When they branch, they're going to actually divide and sort of branch into what are known as smaller arteries, known as arterioles. So there's that branching that we established in the first flowchart, just a little bit more detail. Arterioles are simply smaller branches of arteries. Now, these are going to branch even smaller and get even smaller into what now are going to be considered capillaries. So well, this is going to eventually, arterioles, their job is to deliver blood to the next type of vessel known as capillaries. So capillaries are not a type of artery, even though they're listed under this part of the flowchart. They're actually going to be a new type uh, of blood vessel that we'll focus on next. So delivers blood to capillaries. Capillaries are the, the smallest division of the blood vessels that we see within a cardiovascular system. So let's take a look at what capillaries are and what their purpose is. This is going to be a major site of a lot of exchange. A lot of action is going to take place in the capillaries within a closed circulatory system. Structurally speaking, capillaries are microscopic. They are very, very small, almost impossible to see with the naked eye, and these are going to be blood vessels also. So they're microscopic blood vessels, and their job is to infiltrate organs. So infiltrate sometimes has a negative connotation, but here we actually want this infiltration of organs because organs, again, need blood. Blood is being sent to them via arteries, going away from the heart, to the organs. They're going to branch into arterioles, and then the arterioles will divide into capillaries. Capillaries are then going to, uh, they're going to vascularize and get into these organs that need the oxygen, and they're going to deliver the oxygen and the nutrients and the blood overall to them, specifically via this mechanism and route that we've just covered. Now, this infiltration will happen specifically at an area of the capillaries known as capillary beds. Capillary beds are going to be the site and site where we see a network of capillaries 
sort of join together doing a simultaneous and cohesive job. And this is going to be the specific structure that goes uh, even deeper than the organ level. These will actually infiltrate tissues. So because they're infiltrating tissues, many capillary beds will then overall infiltrate an organ. So this infiltrates tissues, and this is going to be a major, major site of exchange. This is where we basically see the exchange of material between the blood and organs with blood. So we exchange material with the blood, we give our, the blood the CO2 that we've already sort of as, had, have as a byproduct here, and then we pick up the oxygen. That's a, a very simple and basic exchange that occurs within and at this capillary bed level. Now, the capillaries themselves are now going to, because they've just received something from the organs, they actually have to turn into a larger structure and start branching into something else. Capillaries, therefore, will merge together eventually on the other side of them, let's say, to form what are known as venules. And that's now our next and third vessel that we have to look at. So we have arteries, just to reiterate, going away from the heart to the organs of the body. They're going to branch into arterioles. At the capillary bed, we'll have this exchange. And then after the exchange is done, the capillary beds and the capillaries will branch into venules. Venules are going to be a structure that are going to specifically follow the blood vessel sort of area and route that are known as veins. Veins, their job is to receive blood from the venules. Receive blood from venules. So this blood has just been given sort of to them via the organs that sort of gave off their waste products or gave off their CO2 and now the veins are carrying this blood from the venules. Now, what's going to be specific here that we need to understand is that veins themselves are going to be uh, sandwiched. They're going to be right in between many different muscles. They're very, very purposefully and specifically placed between muscles. And this is because when you have something like muscle movement, muscle movement requires energy, it requires oxygen, it requires nutrient exchange, etc. So it must require blood. But once that exchange has happened, the muscles themselves are going to have some sort of byproduct, let's say. And that byproduct has to go away and be filtered out, let's say. And so with this muscle movement, well, this will directly result in what is known as venous pressure. And when you have venous pressure, this is what's going to essentially push the blood along the veins for this reason. So the blood moves along the Veins. This is oftentimes why when you're doing some sort of strenuous activity, you see increased vascularization. You see veins that are um, protruding out. This is because you have all of this movement occurring, causing more pressure to build up within veins, causing blood to be pushed through veins at a much faster rate because of, again, their location, specifically sandwiched between muscles. Now, a major part of veins that we need to understand is the fact that veins are going to have valves. Valves are, again, Things that open and close. We've seen valves before. We saw them throughout the, throughout the digestive system. But in this situation of circulation, we have to be very, very specific and critical of how blood flows. Again, direction is critically important when understanding circulation. Valves are going to really push forward and ensure that direction is maintained. How? Valves within veins are going to open and close in order to prevent, in order to prevent backflow of blood. We never want blood to go backwards in the system. It has to go one way. And that one way in this situation right now is towards the heart. And then once it's at the heart, it will go through the arteries away from the heart and start this process all over again. Keep in mind that this is again a unidirectional flow of blood through these blood vessels. We'll highlight that unidirectional flow as we move forward in this lecture when we focus more specifically on the human heart. But just know that valves are structures found only in veins that ensure and open and close specifically in order to prevent backflow of blood, to ensure and maintain a unidirectional flow. Finally, the last thing that we want to focus on in a cardiovascular closed circulatory system is that final structure known as the heart. Again, this is a muscular pump. It's going to push everything through the system. But specifically in those vertebrates that have a cardiovascular system, a heart will have two or more muscular chambers. So before we just said that it was a muscular pump, now we're being a little bit more specific and stating that it may have two or more muscular chambers. Those chambers are as follows. A heart will have an atrium, 
and the atrium, there may be one or two of them, depending on the species. So we would state that this is one or two atria. Atria, A-T-R-I-A, -A, is the plural of atrium. And this is, again, dependent on the species in question. Some have one, some have two. And the job of the atrium here, much like the arteries, it's going to be very much going to be involved in receiving blood. I, I, much like the veins, I should say. Receives blood that's going to be returning to the blood, returning to the heart from the tissues. So this is going to be the first part of the heart that gets access to and receives the blood coming back from the tissues. And again, where would that be coming from? That would be, of course, coming from a vein because, look, veins push blood towards the heart, and the first part of the heart that receives this venous blood is the atrium. Receives blood returning from tissues, a.k.a. coming from veins because veins were just next to the tissues. Now, in addition to the atrium, that's one of the muscular chambers, there's also going to be a ventricle. The ventricle may, again, be present in one or two uh, amount. So there may be one or two ventricles, again, dependent on the species in question. And specifically here, the ventricle's job is basically the opposite of the atrium. Instead of receiving blood, the ventricle now has to pump blood, and that's what it does. This is the specific part of the heart that pumps blood away. It pumps blood away. That's the key here. We have to keep a focus on direction from heart, from heart, away from the heart, to the arteries, and then eventually to the tissues via this mechanism that we saw in the blood vessels. Finally, last thing we want to cover in terms of the muscular nature of the heart is a structure that surrounds uh, the entire heart known as the pericardium. The pericardium is going to be an, in an enclosing sac of the heart. It really sort of wrapped itself around the entire heart, and this is going to be important because it maintains the heart's structure. It essentially is going to be uh, an idea, a tissue that's going to overall support the muscles found within the heart and make sure that it's cohesively kept in a nice uh, confined area because we have a lot of muscular action going on here, a lot of activity, and thus we want to make sure that it's confined to the specific and uh, correct areas that we've seen thus far. So that covers our look at vertebrate circulation. What we just want to focus on is now looking at how we do circulation within vertebrates, the actual patterns of circulation in the next flowchart.